Welcome to the ACS Technical Advisory Board podcast series, where we talk all things tech including data, cyber, AI, blockchain, and Internet of Things. Meet your host, Dr. David Cook, Vice President of the Australian Computer Society's Technical Boards. David is a technology advocate dedicated to advances and progression of computing and human-computer interaction. In today's episode, David will be talking with ACS Data Sharing Committee member, Ben Smith. Join us as we discuss digital identity control, data sharing frameworks, and subdermal biometrics. Today, I'm talking with Benjamin Smith. He has over 25 years of experience in the IT industry. Ben consults to the IT sector, and he is passionate about the way data is used, it's stored, and it's shared, or in some cases, not shared for different purposes. Ben, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, David. Let's start by talking about identity. And, and the, the, importantly, can we take back control of our identity? Is, I know that's a, a, a passion mm. piece for you. Mm. What should we be doing? Is it too late? Can we can we fix this? What are the, what are the issues? Uh, well, I don't think anything's ever too late. I think there's, there's already been some damage done. In saying that, though, um, I think we're in we're living in an exciting time where uh, we do now have the technology available where we can give citizens the ability to to have better control over their identity and and their data. So what I mean by that is, if I think about uh, my lifetime, so in excess of forty years, um, as an adult, I've got into life and I've had to rent houses, sign up for for telephone contracts, um, establish bank accounts, so on and so forth. And for each of those transactions, I've had to hand over a multitude of sensitive information um, and identifying documents. Now, at no point has, when that relationship has changed, where I've maybe gone from one telecommunications provider to another, um, not one of those organisations has ever reached out to suggest that they voluntarily remove my data from from their systems. Um, In actual fact, when there was uh, the breach with Optus, Um, Even though I'd been a customer of them for six months, 10 years ago, my data was contained in that breach. So so, I know that there's a challenge in the sense that I've handed, willingly handed that information over um, over the course of my life to gain access to certain services. When I've tried to reach out to ask for their removal, sometimes I'm told that yes, um, that has happened, but I don't necessarily have evidence of that. And then on other occasions, I'm told it's too hard and by saying it's too hard, it might be that they can remove the information from the database that they access live. Uh, but in terms of their backups, my data is still retained within those backups and it's not as easy to then remove myself from all of those backups. Um, but typically, um, that would be the ideal situation, but typically even to remove my data from um, from that live database, uh, it doesn't seem to be an option. So I think for me, what I'd really love to see us as a society prog- progress towards is, and I think the federal government needs to be involved here at some level, but establishing a trusted um, data sharing framework that uh, provides standards, provides commonality, um, so that businesses um, can access data for individuals, because I, I do understand that, and I run a business, we need to know who people are. Um, But, for example, uh, when I checked into the hotel last night, I I handed over my my ID. Um, There was information on that ID that they didn't necessarily know, or need to know, rather. But they wanted to know that if something was to happen, that they knew I am who I say I am. What I'd like to see with that that data sharing framework is the ability to have a digital ID, uh, whether that's provided by private business or whether that's uh, something that the government provides, whereby when I need to have an interaction with a business like a hotel or uh, a telecommunications provider, at that point, I can hand over the information that they need to know. Um, once that relationship changes, though, so for example, with the hotel, I may never go back to that hotel again. They don't need that data. So I should be in a position where I can remove that data from their database or remove their access to, to my digital wallet, essentially. So let's ask about some of the, one of the questions about the, you know, you, you talked about the, the trusted da- uh, data sharing framework. The key word in that is trusted because Correct. we already have data sharing frameworks. They're just not very good. <laughs> they, yeah. they share like crazy yeah. and in all the wrong places. Um, 
so if we do, if we are going to move to a, a system where there's a particular type of some something that says this is my trusted ID and you need to trust it, mm. and it doesn't tell you all of the other bits and pieces that's mm. on my passport or my driver's license mm. that you just don't need to know. You just mm. need to know that you can trust the guy. Um, I just wonder, you know, we've got various versions starting to emerge from the MyGov platform. Yes, yes. That's one direction of it. I'm not sure that's the direction. And, and there's a lot of people, obviously, who don't trust the MyGov because people don't trust many of the aspects mm. of government. That's a natural thing in any country anywhere, not just Australia. I just wonder if in its place, if, if industry, if something else will emerge or is it is emerging? Because every individual has um, a range of different ways in which they interact Mm. You talked about a hotel for other mm. people. It's some other form of interaction where they have to prove themselves one way or mm. another. Um, but, but no one is, and, you, and, and the point is, no one is going to actively come back and say, oh, yeah, sorry, Ben, you're leaving the hotel. We're going to wipe your data now. Right? Correct. No one is doing that. There's, yeah. there's no appetite from industry for that at all. Mm. How do we create that appetite? How do, we, I mean, how do we make people want to do that? That's a really good question, David. Um, so... From my perspective, it's about awareness. So the, the businesses um, aren't necessarily going to uh, going to be forthright and saying that this is what we're doing with your data, this is how we're collecting it, this is where we might be on selling your data. I think it's about education for society. So I remember growing up as a child, there was a lot of noise um, about uh, Bob Hawke wanting to introduce the Australia card. And the idea behind that was having a way or a means of being able to easily access government services. Um, at the time, a lot of people were really concerned about how that might be used and, and how that could be an invasion of their privacy. So that was never implemented. What we've got now is a situation where for every day of our life, at least for the last 20 years, um, whether it's going to the coffee shop and you're a part of a, a membership loyalty program where you have to hand over your mobile number to get your 10th coffee free, mm. um, whether it's uh, making a booking at a restaurant and you can't just call up, you have to do do that online. We're unwittingly um, leaving this massive digital exhaust of information behind us that we actually have no control over. Um, and as we've seen with, with data breaches, um, the, the release of that information could be quite detrimental to you. So I think it's about educating the public to say that this is what a secure, trusted digital ID would look like. Uh, I do take your point and the concerns around that being a, a government issued ID. I've been involved in, uh, in a biometric startup that was looking to, to create this digital wallet. Um, there's a lot of trust that comes with that. I would argue that uh, it's not impossible, um, but it would be a very daunting task, very challenging, and I know, having lived through it for five years, to try and build that platform and to establish that trust with a citizen as opposed to a government who, and, you know, I, I'm conflicted as I say this, but we should be able to trust our government. And if we can't, we need to do things to make sure that we that we can. And that's to say as well, I don't believe that a this form of ID that I'm talking about should be compulsory. Uh, it should be voluntary. You should be able to enter into it. Uh, and that's the point. This is all about choice and all about taking control over your data. If you don't mind that, uh, that you're leaving your information um, across a multitude of different businesses and they can contact you day and night, that's perfectly fine. So let's talk about biometrics then. So is biometrics a big part of the solution, do you think? Uh, look, I, I think it's still early days. I think biometrics can can play a part in that. Uh, biometrics can be very good. So the, the example um, I can provide is uh, in a lot of capital cities in Australia now, you have to provide your ID to, to be able to enter a licensed venue after a certain point in time. The justification for that is that if you were within that venue and something was to happen, um, you maybe did the wrong thing, then they know that they can identify you. Um, and they also know that they can limit your ability from coming back, whether it's for three months, six months, forever. Um, collecting collect, or using someone's form of ID has a lot of risk. And I've, I've seen this, I've worked within that sector. Um, it can be as simple as uh, a younger sister using their older sister's ID. Um, uh, we also saw a lot of uh, IDs, and, and particularly in Perth, actually, uh, where people were um, spending $20 to buy a fake ID from China. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, 
that's where biometrics can play a part for public good in the sense that typically your face doesn't change or your fingerprint doesn't change. That can That is a part of your identity. For that particular solution I'm talking about, it did have all of the controls in place whereby if you wanted to remove yourself from the system, you could. Um, it would remove you from, from all of the associated backups. Let me ask you a question about subdermal biometrics. So I'm, I'm uh, an advocate for, I've, I've got a cat, the cat's been microchipped. I've got mm -hmm. a dog, the dog's mm -hmm. been microchipped. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, luckily, I, it was during the COVID times, I had myself chipped. And I had a tiny little chip in it. It was fantastic. I had it for three months, had it surgically implanted. It was mm -hmm. part of a big experiment. Mm -hmm. And during that time, I enjoyed free access. I used it for access control. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to have a swipe card. I just, just went -loop -loop with my hand and it was, I really enjoyed that. More importantly, the freedom of knowing I could just, I, I was releasing the information I wanted and I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to show someone my driver's license, my passport or any of the other things. I just made, it made life work really mm, well. Mm. And when I thought about it, and I've thought about it a lot, you know, what's the difference? I've, my dog's microchipped. It didn't hurt. It was a bit itchy. That's mm. it. That's mm. all. Do you think that's a possibility or is that just too far and people won't accept it? Um, again, I think it comes down to personal choice. I, um, uh, I was quite excited, and this was just before COVID, uh, there was actually an ACS um, branch forum event whereby, and I, I forget the, the fellow's name, but uh, uh, this particular speaker was talking about the fact that he had been microchipped and what that meant for access control and other things that he was working on. And it was something I was looking into for myself. I then met my wife and she's very much opposed to that way of thinking. And so I, I didn't entertain it uh, from that point forward. But I think if, again, it comes down to control, if I can trust that I've got complete control over that uh, that device, then absolutely. I, I'd, at home, for example, uh, but we, we don't have keys on the front door. So my wife is forever losing her keys. Um, and for me, it was just the point of convenience, one less thing to carry in my pocket. So to gain access to the house now, we use um, fingerprint. Uh, we have visitors who come around regularly. I don't have to cut all of these keys now. Uh, we can provide them access to the to the house uh, quite easily. Uh, and if they choose not to, to register their fingerprint, then that's perfectly fine. We'll, we'll provide them with a PIN number. The benefit for me with, with uh, that as an approach is that if for whatever reason we want to remove someone's access, we don't have to ask them for the key that we cut back, uh, we can remove their, their access from, from the system. But in t coming back to your point um, about insertable chips and, and whatever else, again, I think it, it does come down to personal choice. My, my only concern with that would be how that could be tracked by others. So if, if businesses or government were looking to try and uh, record your movements, as an example. But I think realistically, it's actually harder to do that with a chip than what it is now with biometrics where I, on the walk here today, I, I made before the podcast, I made the joke that, uh, well, not joke, uh, but the, the observation that I probably walked past 20 cameras and you jokingly said that, hey, we're in Sydney, it, it's more likely it was 200. Mm. Uh, and yeah, I've got absolutely no, no control over that. I understand why those cameras are there and it is for public good, but where's the privacy policy that relates to those and, and, and tells us and defines that that footage is removed after seven days or if you've got nothing to worry about uh, or sorry if you if you didn't commit an offense then your data is not used it's not retained there, there's there's none of that at the moment so the, obviously privacy is a big part of this mm. because we it's just the part, it's the part we don't trust mm. the, the way in which it's used you, you've got a way of handling phone numbers uh, which you were talking about before tell us about how you uh, effectively get around that issue where people are constantly asking for their, their mobile number yeah, so I wouldn't say it's very effective at this point in time, but um, essentially I, I went through a situation uh, earlier this year where I lost my mobile number. Um, there was an issue with the telco um, and it basically it meant that it was going to be easier for me to just have a new mobile number, which that in itself uh, was, was quite a dramatic experience in the sense that I lost access to a lot of my, um, my online accounts because I, I had MFA tokens that uh, were related to that, to that mobile number. But when I went uh, through the process of re-establishing my mobile number, what I wanted to do was take note of the amount of times I'd, I'd receive a spam phone call or uh, messages that were clearly trying to, that were fraudulent. Um, the approach that I took was to establish a, 
a phone number that presents itself as a landline. So in my case, living in Queensland, it was 07. Um, and it meant that if someone wanted to call, they can call me on the on the phone. Uh, but it, I, I wouldn't receive any messages on that. Now, uh, that is an experiment, uh, had very mixed results. Uh, a lot of businesses uh, made it very hard for me to deal with them. Um, so in some cases, uh, I, I couldn't deal with them at all. Um, to give you a particular example, uh, my my GP, so when when they asked for my mobile number, when I, when I started uh, going to the doctor, I, I gave them the landline and I said, well, no, we need to have your mobile number. And I queried, well, what is it that you need my mobile number for? Well, to provide you with confirmation of your appointment. I said, well, that's that's fine. When, when I've made the appointment, I've written that down. I've taken note of that. Um, I, I don't need to have that functionality. I oh, no, 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 but we'd like to confirm a day out that you're definitely coming to your appointment. And I said, well, that's fine. If I believe that I'm not going to be able to make it, uh, I'll ring and let you know. But no, 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 no. And so, and I've had similar situations with a lot of other businesses where it does become very challenging to be able to to establish that relationship without handing over a mobile number. In, in some in some areas, I've had some success, uh, but in others, uh, yeah, I've, I've unfortunately just had to succumb and, and hand out my, my mobile telephone number. But again, that's where, with what I was talking about earlier, if I had a digital wallet where I could control um, that relationship, uh, the relationship tied to accessing my data, I'd feel a lot more comfortable with handing out my mobile number, knowing that I can cut that off at some point. Ben, it's been fascinating listening to you talk about the way in which we need to handle the way in which data is shared. Look forward to talking to you again. Thanks for being on the program. No worries. Thank you very much, David. Appreciate it. To find out more about how the ACS is powering Australia's technology brilliance, visit us at our website, Facebook or LinkedIn. Want to get involved with the ACS technical boards? Email us at tab at acs.org.au and tell us a bit about yourself. Join us for more thought leadership, ideas and information through our other podcasts on the ACS YouTube, Facebook or on LinkedIn. LinkedIn.